Mot de la police. Thank you, Jose. Thank you very much. Bonsoir à tous et bienvenue et merci d'avoir assisté à notre édition canadienne à la, décou de, à la découverte de l'histoire panaméricaine. Nous avons des partenaires d'affaires, des chers clients, nos amis et membres de la famille et employés qui se joignent à nous ce soir, non seulement ici à Montréal, au, au Canada, mais aussi euh, partout à travers la région panaméricaine. Et merci à tout le monde pour nous, se joindre à nous ce soir. Nous avons commencé ce, ce segment After Office en juin dernier avec notre équipe du Mexique et nous sommes ravis de continuer à en apprendre davantage sur les diverses cultures, les traditions et les événements de nos pays familiaux qui ont contribué à façonner leur société et leur mode de vie actuel. Today's Concordia, uh, today, Concordia University Senior Lecturer and Associate Chair, Dr. Gavin Taylor, PhD, will be presenting on fish, furs, and forests, Canada, uh, Canada as an economic outpost in a global world. Dr. Taylor received his PhD from the College of William and Mary and has also worked as a, uh, as a journalist. He is currently writing a textbook uh, for Oxford University Press. So hats off, doctor. Uh, provisionally titled Two Roads to Heaven, a history of native settler relations in North America. He has taught a broad range of, course, of courses in North American history, as well as on subjects related to public history and on politics of the past. Ce soir, maître de conférence et président associé de l'Université Concordia, Dr. Gavin Taylor, PhD, fera une présentation sur les poissons, les fourrures et les forêts. Le Canada en tant qu'avant-poste économique dans un monde mondial. Le Dr. Taylor a obtenu son doctorat du Collège of William and Mary et a également travaillé comme journaliste. Il rédige actuellement un manuel pour Oxford University Press intitulé provisoirement Two Roads to Heaven, A History of Native Settlers' Relations in North America. Il a enseigné un large éventail de cours sur l'histoire de l'Amérique du Nord ainsi que sur des sujets liés à l'histoire publique et à la politique du passé. Alors tous ensemble, partenaires, clients, familles, membres, de, euh, amis, et ainsi que clients, euh, aidez-nous à faire le bienvenu ce soir pour Dr. Gavin Taylor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mudluck. Thank you, Dante. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Yanisha, for all inviting me. And thank you all for uh, showing up tonight. So I was asked to give uh, an introductory lecture of, about Canadian history. Uh, and I'm guessing a lot of you don't know that much about Canada when you think about Canada. Um, you're probably thinking about often nature. You might have an idea that it's really cold, that there are mountains, that there are lakes. Um, oops, so I'm trying to get I'm trying to get a presentation going and it's not letting me do it. Um, hold on. Okay, I'm going to try again. Can you see my presentation, by the way? Yes, uh, I can see it. And uh, is it, this yes, is PowerPoint, correct? PowerPoint. Oh, uh, it should, uh, ah. If uh, function five should uh, present them. Okay, so you can all see it now. Yep, perfect. Great. Okay, so you all think of nature when you think about Canada. I'm guessing, like I said, you think it's a big, cold place. Uh, and in many ways, this is one of the defining characteristics of Canada, that Canada is very much a country that's defined by its geography. I mean, the, Sigmund Freud famously said that biology is destiny. We're sort of, our, our, our identity is determined by the body we're born, born into. By the same token, Canada, the, 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 the nature of Canada, the form of Canada as a country has been really shaped uh, by its natural features. And in fact, there was a, One of Canada's most famous novelists is Margaret Atwood, and she wrote a book about literature uh, in Canadian literature. And one of the distinctions she made, so our, our neighbors to the south in the United States uh, tend to think about manifest destiny. They think about conquering nature, of bringing nature to heal, of taming the land, submit it to their will. By contrast, Canadians, if we try to conquer nature, usually it conquers us. And so the theme she saw in Canadian literature was not about conquering nature, instead it's about survival, that the, 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 
the main theme of Canadian culture and Canadian life has been surviving uh, in a world, in a nature. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about the history of Canada as sort of an adaptation to the environment uh, in which we find ourselves. So I'm going to start off not 250 years ago. I'm going to go back 250 million years ago. I realize I'm going very far into the past here. Um, and about 250 million years ago, you had this kind of supercontinent that existed in the world. Geologists often refer to it as Pangaea. So if you go back 250 years, all these continents, the Americas, Africa, Australia, Europe, are all part of this agglomeration. And gradually over the next several hundred million years, they all break out into their own individual continents. And this gives us the shape that we find ourselves in now. So you can see from this image, you see these continents, these tectonic plates that are breaking apart and reshaping themselves. And so Canada, like other continents, other countries, is the product of. And so Canada, I mean, a lot of us Canadians, we sort of know these facts about our countries. We know that we're the second largest country in the world, according to our geographical extent. We know that we have the most freshwater lakes in the world. And so um, one of the defining features of Canada is this feature right here. It's called the Canadian Shield. So for most of the northern half of Canada, there's this mass of volcanic rock that's formed as the result of the breaking away of Pangaea. So the Canadian Shield, as you can see, it covers most of the eastern part of the country has a couple of defining characteristics. When I talk about geography being destiny, one of these, one of these consequences is that, um, first of all, it's, uh, it's very unfriendly towards farming. Okay? So the, the, the rock that you have in the Canadian Shield uh, is, is, is tough. It doesn't really yield much in the way of crops. And in any event, in Canada, we have, it's a very cold country. We don't have a very long growing season. So the Canadian Shield is inhospitable towards agriculture. On the other hand, the Canadian Shield is also dense with minerals. Canada has more foreign mining investment than any other country in the world. The Canadian Shield produces iron and nickel and copper and uranium, all kinds of other minerals. So this is defining facts, geographical facts of Canada. It helps to explain how it develops as a country. Now, another factor when you talk about sort of these long term geological factors that help explain the history of the country is that Canada, like the rest of North America, is shaped by what happened following the last ice age. OK, so technically this is referred to the ice age is referred to as the Wisconsin glaciation. So about 100,000 years ago, you can see from this diagram the the temperature of the entire world takes a plunge. It goes way down. And so, you know, you can see that 100,000 years ago, the temperature had been formally um, around 14 degrees, similar to what it is today. And then it plunges down to an average of about zero degrees. So what this means in terms of North America is you have this great sheet of ice. As, as temperatures go down, uh, basically all of what is now Canada is covered by this sheet of ice. And gradually, over the next 100,000 years, gradually that ice sheet starts to melt. Yeah, and Professor, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we are seeing your PowerPoint screen, not, not the actual uh, presentation. OK, um, all right. I, but the, OK, because I just want to make sure I can see the questions. Is that? Uh, OK, I'll just I'll just go. With you you, you uh, prefer to continue that way. It's fine. I just wanted to let you know. Does it make it easier? If, well, I'll, OK, I'll go this way. I'll go this way. Also. OK, so gradually this ice sheet starts to recede. As it recedes, it leaves behind um, a certain amount of, uh, well, first of all, it leaves behind a certain um, amount of melted water which takes the form of lakes, and it also leaves behind certain geographical formations, such as hills and, and, and uh, mountains. Uh, and so even now, by 5,000 years ago, 
now that ice sheet has receded, but the geographical shape of Canada takes hold. And one of the most important things is, okay, so on one hand, you have these mountains that are formed. You also have lakes. In the eastern part of Canada, you can see from this map, these are some maps sort of illustrating all the rivers that lead into the interior of North America. So if you see at the right-hand side of that map, where you get to Canada, you have the St. Lawrence River. So the St. Lawrence River uh, is this river that snakes into the interior, and then it adjoins these five great lakes. We call them the Great Lakes, so Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, Lake Superior. So basically, more than any other river system in North America, this system of the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes leads into the interior. Sorry? <laughs> more than any other. Okay, so this is sort of the setting in which Canadian history takes place. And so human beings, we think this is all hypothesis, this is coming from archaeological evidence, that at least 12,000, probably 30 or 40,000 years before today, you have people who migrate from Asia, from the northern, northeastern part of Asia, by that time, it's one big landmass because the land is frozen and they travel into the Americas. I won't go into detail, okay, but we're talking somewhere between 15,000, maybe 30,000, maybe 40,000 years. People come down through the, Bar through the Bering Strait or through Beringia and they make their way to the Americas. Okay, so in Canada, so as you have this migration, the people who come and arrive in what's now Canada are really ingenious in the way in which they adapt to their local surroundings. So this is an image of an Inuit man. So the Inuit are the people who live in the Arctic area of Canada. And the Arctic of Canada is very inhospitable to human beings. It's, it's terribly cold. There are no trees. Um, there's uh, snow everywhere. There are very few landmarks. It's very hard to navigate. Uh, it's very hard. To, very hard to keep warm. And so, you know, how do you survive in an environment in which uh, there are no plants, there are no trees, uh, there are no landmarks? Well, they do so by building a whole host of technology. So here you can see that here, this is, a, this is an image of an Inuit man who was kidnapped by the English and brought back to England. And he actually was, he actually per, sort of performed for people uh, in London. Uh, but you can see, okay, so he's wearing clothing uh, that is very warm, so you have to survive off of the products of animals. So there's sort of a double layered clothing that the Inuit devise. Uh, without any wood to build houses, they build houses, igloos out of ice. Um, without any wood to burn to keep themselves warm, they use whale blubber, the, the fat of whales, in order to keep themselves warm. They develop a whole host of instruments. They develop uh, instruments for snowing, sewing out of the bone of animals. Uh, they develop uh, all kinds of technology for traveling in water. They have the kayak, they have the umiak, which is a much larger boat. In this image, uh, someone's holding a that ladle. It's a sort of it's a harpoon that you can use. It's sort of a device to make harpoons go faster and more swiftly. Um, if you go further to the south, you also have people in perhaps more hospitable environments who develop other technologies in order to survive. So probably one of the most famous and important technologies you have in Canada is the canoe. Okay, so the canoe is a boat that's made out of birch bark that indigenous people in Canada use in order to travel, in order to hunt, in order to get to one place to the next. Very efficient. Basically, you know, the sports canoe today that's designed with scientific precision is really not that different from the kind of canoe that indigenous people would have used. Here's an image from the 1860s of a group of indigenous people uh, in northern Ontario who are hunting in a place where there are lots of mosquitoes. That's where they're wearing masks because, because the insects are so terrible. Here's another example of ingenious technology that's used in order to get the most out of the environment. This is a buffalo jump. Okay, So there are lots of bison that live in the Great Plains of Canada. Uh, they travel in herds. And so this is an example of a cliff. And so what hunters would do is they would get the hunter, the, the bison to start stampeding. 
they would go so fast they couldn't retreat and then they they managed to corral them until they go to the cliff they jump over the side of the cliff and then once that's done they can slaughter them so there's actually piles of bison skill skulls that are killed using this method um, so I, I will go I could go into detail about all the different groups in what is now Canada and how they use technology to to get there to, to exploit the most of their environment but in general okay so in terms of the entire country there are people who live the indigenous people who live within what is now as Canada what is now Canada um, have to survive off of animals and wild plants the the, the, the environment is not promising when it comes to agriculture, except the very southern part, the very southern part of what is now Canada, where there's agriculture, it sort of takes hold about a thousand years ago. So this is this is the three three sisters of the Haudenosaunee who live in what's now uh, close to what's now Toronto. Um, they did adopt agriculture, but most other groups don't. OK, so in Canada, what you have is a vast territory where people have to live off of animals and wild plants. Now, because they don't have agriculture, in general, the population is quite low. You know, compared to, say, what you have amongst the Aztecs or the, the Inca, these are very small populations of people. And so when Europeans come to Canada, they're arriving in a territory that's much more lightly populated than, say, the Central Valley of Mexico or um, the Andean Mountains. And the thing that brings Europeans to Canada is actually, it doesn't really bring them to the landmass itself. It brings them to the waters off of Canada. And the thing that brings them is this animal right here, this fish right here, the codfish. Okay, So the codfish is this large fish uh, that preys on other fish in the North Atlantic. And it is the one thing leads Europeans to become interested in what is now Canada. And so the origins of that interest go back to the Middle Ages. So by the Middle Ages, by the 13th and 14th century, Europeans had in large part overfished the, the fish that lived in their rivers and their inshore inshore areas of Europe. Um, so he, there's even a quotation here from France, the king of France in the 13th century saying every river and water side of a realm, large and small, yields nothing due to the evil of the fishers and the devices of their contriving. Okay, so there was a problem of depleted fisheries and yet Europeans depended on fish. Okay, so the fish were an important part of their diet, especially because um, there were a lot of fast days in, in the Christian calendar. There are many days in the course of the year that you could not eat meat. And so fish was necessary as a substitute. And so what Europeans do is they develop ways of um, preserving fish, of using salt as a way of keeping it for a long period. So instead of having to, you know, if, if, you, if you catch a fish and you just leave it out on a table, after a week, it's going to start to stink. It's going to be rotten. It's going to turn green. It's not going to be edible. So if you want to keep a fish for a long period of time, you have to do something to cure it, something to make it, um, preserve, something to preserve it for a long period of time. And so this is what happens in the 14th century. Okay, So they develop a salt cure for fish, for herring in Northern Europe. And what this does is makes it possible to turn fish into a commercial product, into an item of trade, you know? So in the same way, you know, I can, I can buy a can, can of Coca-Cola now, and that's not going to go bad. I can keep it on the shelf for a year or two years, and I can still sell it, and it's not going to go rotten. And so if you're able to cure fish in this fashion now, it's not just something you catch and then you eat. It's something you can turn into a commercial commodity. And so one of the fish that people become interested in is cod. And cod is good for preserving because it has less fat and therefore it's less likely to spoil. And it's also a very large fish. It can, you can feed a lot of people with just one fish. There are also animals that travel in schools, so they tend to, tend to be caught in large quantities. And so cod is a very desirable fish if you want to use something, use it as something you're gonna trade commercially. And the first group that really exploits this possibility, this commercial possibility, 
are the Basques. Okay? So the Basques are a group, I don't know, you might be familiar with them, who live between France and Spain. Uh, they have access to a large deposits. Okay? So they're ideally situated. They're bordering the Atlantic. They have access to salt. And they're traveling further and further into the ocean in order to find more fish. And sometime in the 1400s, we don't know because they want to keep this information secret. If you're a fisherman, you know a good source of fish, you're not going to tell people about it. So the Basques probably know about the, the fish off the coast of Canada long before they actually make it official. But in any event, sometime in the 1400s, probably, they're starting to travel further and further out into the Atlantic, and they discover a new source of cod. Okay, so they're moving west of Great Britain, west of Iceland, west of Greenland, and they encounter this area. It's called the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. Okay, so you can see from this image that it's a place where you have a cold current that's coming down from the north, the Labrador current. So this kind of cold body of water that's coming from the north, and then a warmer body of water that's coming from the south in the form of the Gulf Stream. And so this combination of a cold current and a warm current creates a lot of life. Okay, So at this plate, the Grand Banks is sort of at the intersection of these two currents. It's very productive in terms of, in terms of plankton very productive in terms of a whole range of fish. And so in the 1400s, this area is absolutely teeming with cod fish. And so you have these Basque fishermen who make their way to the Grand Banks, and there are also other areas, other banks of fish further to the south. This is kind of an upside down map here. So the north is on this, the bottom of the page, the top. But fishermen from the Basque country are making their way to the Grand Banks and they're coming back with ships that are absolutely full to the brim with cod. And so when you catch cod, there are two ways of curing it, of, of, of salting it. One of them is known as a wet cure or a green cure. Okay, so that basically means that when you catch the fish, you throw some salt on top of it while you're on board in the ship and you keep it in the ship until you come back home to your home port. Okay, so the advantage of the wet cure is you don't have to stop, you don't have to go on, on shore. Uh, it's a quick and easy way of curing the fish. Now there's also a dry cure. So the dry cure means that you actually salt the fish and then you actually go on shore. Okay, so you take the fish, you catch it, and then you go on shore. And when you're on shore, this is an image from the 18th century, uh, when you're on shore, then you put it on a stage, so this elevated platform, you, you gut the fish, you cut it open, you salt it, you leave it to dry in the sun, and it becomes something that's very hard and very firm. And so, you can actually process a lot more fish when you're doing this. Now, the disadvantage is it takes a lot more time. Something that actually requires the infrastructure on shore to build these stages and flakes. So here's another image. Again, the same sort of thing. Here are people who are, who are taking the fish, they're salting it, they're drying it, uh, and they're storing it uh, in, in a cook room. Again, another image from 1663 where they have a fishing stage, a shallop, which is that boat that's carrying the fish to the stage, and then a cook room. And his, you know, essentially the, the method for fishing remains unchanged for hundreds of years. So this is an image from 1900, but essentially it's the same kind of method that people would have used in 1600. And so there are these, these huge flakes with all kinds of dried cod on it. Same thing over here. You can see just meter after meter of dried cod. And so, you know, I, I don't know, I, when I lived in Toronto, uh, if you go to a Portuguese market, there are just piles and piles of this dried bacalao, this kind of dried cod uh, that comes originally came from Newfoundland. So as I said, originally it's mostly the Basques who are interested in this cod fish, but as people learn about the value of this fish, uh, other countries also become interested. So from 1497 to 1550, it's mostly the French who are coming from Brittany or coming from Normandy. 
Portuguese also joined them. So remember, these are countries that are boarding the Atlantic. So they're already sailing the Atlantic. They're already people who are fishing in the ocean. And so once they learn that there's this valuable source of fish, they start becoming interested in it. They start sailing every, they go out in the spring, they uh, load up a ship, they hire a crew, they go out into the Atlantic, they might spend a month or two months or three months there, and they come back with the holds of their ships filled to the brim with this cod that it fetches a very valuable price in their home ports. So you've got the French who dominate in the early 1500s, and then the English also become interested in the late 16th century. Uh, so this is an estimate from an English fisherman from 1578. So at that time, you had 50 English ships, 50 Portuguese ships, 100 Basque ships, and 100 French ships, either Breton or Norman, who are fishing in the Grand Banks cod fishery. So an estimated catch of 75,000 tons. So by that, time, by that time, we're reaching the levels you really see until the 19th century. So by the 1600s, by the 17th century, it's mostly the French and the English, and they're fishing somewhere between 200,000 and 250,000 metric tons of cod every year. And that's really the same amount that would have been caught in the early 20th century. They're using more or less the same methods. So the volume of this is impressive. So this is actually a, a graph illustrating the growth of cod fisheries. And you'll notice this more or less consistent uh, through the 1800s until the early to the middle of the 20th century. Then there's this huge spike. And then since then, they've overfished to the extent that since 1992, they've not been able to fish at all. So sort of this fishery that existed for about 500 years and that no longer exists. Okay, so during all this, uh, we've only been talking about the fish. We haven't been talking about uh, any kind of permanent colony, any kind of permanent presence in Newfoundland. And that's because there really wasn't much of a permanent presence, okay? So there were indigenous people who lived in Newfoundland, not a lot of them, they're the Beotuk. So in the entire island, there may be somewhere between 500 and 1,000 of them. Europeans thought about establishing colonies. They called them plantations in Newfoundland. So the English in particular had certain projects to establish a permanent presence in Newfoundland. They're mostly failures. Uh, and the reason is that there's not much reason to want to stay there permanently. If you know you can make a lot of money by just going over for one month or two months or three months, why would you spend the entire year there when you can't farm? Uh, it's not very friendly towards a permanent settlement. It's, it's a terrible climate. Why would you want to spend, why would you want to be there year round? So the thing that makes people interested in staying there year round, well, a couple of things that happen. Okay, so the first is that the Beotuk, the native groups who are living in Newfoundland, when the fishermen left their stages, you know, remember that, so, so the English are taking their fish, they're setting up these temporary stations where they're gonna process the fish, they're gonna have those stages and flakes, and they, in order to build them, they take nails, they take other iron art objects in order to build their houses. And what the Beotuk do is they see that, oh, well, look, here are all these valuable metal objects that the English are bringing, we can use them for our own purposes. So they actually go to the houses, they tear off the nails, they tear off other metal products, they, other, other metal items they find, and they use them for their own purposes. And so what the English found was that whatever houses they built, whatever buildings they built, while they were fishing in Newfoundland, when they returned the next year, were torn apart. And so in order to protect their buildings, they decide, well, we need to have some kind of population that's going to be there year round. And there's also a desire to have Newfoundland integrated into a permanent carrying trade, which included uh, sack, which is kind of alcohol that's being sold uh, in France. Okay, so sort of in the background of all this, okay, so right now it's just kind of, it's mostly a fishing operation. It's mostly about temporarily exploiting uh, a, a, a resource that's available in a seasonable fashion. At this time, there's interest that's coming from other countries in Europe uh, in order to lay claim to the North Atlantic. Okay, so this is, you know, remember at this time, you know, 1492, we have Columbus who sailed to the Caribbean, 
after that, Spain is, is, is laying claim to fabulous fortunes by establishing colonies in New Spain. They're establishing mines in Mexico. They're, they're gutting the Aztec Empire. They're establishing mines in Potosi and Bolivia. Okay, so the Spanish uh, have really laid claim to much of the Western Hemisphere. Now, the northern part of the Americas was considered to be not that interesting. Okay, the people looked around for gold and silver. They didn't really find it. They were hoping to find a passage to India. They didn't find it. So there wasn't that much interest in the North Atlantic. Technically, according to the Pope, this belonged to Spain. Basically, according to the Treaty of Tordesillas, all of this territory belonged to Spain, but the Spanish didn't really care that much about the northern part of the Americas. And so other countries sent out explorers who would put down a flag and would lay claim to territory on behalf of their king. Okay, so you have John Cabot or Giovanni Caboto who sails out to Newfoundland in 1797 and he says this is English territory, he plants the flag. It doesn't really mean very much. The Beota kind of look at the flag and say, oh, that's nice, but it doesn't really amount to anything. And then you have other explorers who do the same thing. Corte Real, who's acting on behalf of the Spanish crowd. Gomez, Berazzano, who's acting on behalf of the French. Cartier, also a French-appointed explorer. Okay, so they're all seeking quick riches, seeking gold and silver. They can't find anything, and so nothing really results of it. Okay, so they have some sense of what the outline of the coastline looks like. This is one of the first maps that uses the word Canada. So you can see there at the bottom of this map, it's a Pierre de Cellier map. Uh, and so this word comes from a voyage uh, by Jacques Cartier. So Jacques Cartier is, there is his name up there, Jacques Cartier is um, an explorer. He comes from, from Brittany, he's a Breton. So he's part of this Part, he's, he comes from a region of France that's involved in the fisheries and that knows about uh, the the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. And he travels down the St. Lawrence River. So the St. Lawrence River, as I said earlier, is sort of this uh, artery of transportation that allows you to get to the interior of the continent. And he's the first European to travel up this river, and he's trying to claim it on behalf of the French. So you can see in that map, it says Terre des Bretons, so land of the Bretons, so land that's claimed by Brittany. And when he gets to the river, he meets some indigenous people there, and obviously they can't speak French and he can speak their language. And he asks them, okay, what is this country? What is this country? And they respond something like Canada. And Canada in the local language actually just means the village. And so it's actually a mistranslation. So he says, ah, this, this country is called Canada, which really just means the village. But this term sticks, okay? So this is where you use the, the, the name Canada. Now, originally, Canada really only refers to the St. Lawrence River and the land around the St. Lawrence River. So, okay, so this, this, this river, which we now call the St. Lawrence, originally is mostly known as Canada. And the people who live on that river are known as Canadians. Okay, so why then, okay, at, even at this point, at the end of the 1500s, most Europeans are still not very interested in Canada other than as a source of fisheries, and then if you want to get fisheries, you don't even have to establish a colony. Now, the thing that gets them interested in the interior of Canada is this animal right here, okay? In English, we refer to it as a beaver, in French, it's known as a casta. I'm not sure what, what's the name is it in Spanish? Does anybody know? It's, uh, it's almost exactly Castor. like French, Castor. Okay. Castor, yes. Okay, so the beaver had been fished, yeah, I'm sorry, the fish had been caught, uh, had been an object of trade in Europe going back a very long time. And in fact, again, sort of similar to uh, the codfish, it's especially after the 13th and 14th centuries that people are becoming more and more interested in furs, in animals that live in northern areas, if, you, if you, an animal lives in a cold climate, it's going to have a thick fur, right? It's going to have a thick, um, thick hair, thick coat of fur uh, that makes it very attractive for people who are making clothing. 
And so from the 13th century onward, most of this, most of these, these furs are coming from the east. They're coming from the Russians, from Novgorod, from Moscow. Uh, it's mostly Moscow that's at the center of people who trap and trade in furs. So here's some images, they have things first, not just beavers, but also squirrels, uh, marten, uh, lynx. Here's actually a European uh, beaver. They were mostly extinct by this time, okay, so they were overhunted in Europe, so they're a rare thing, but beaver actually existed in Europe. And so you can sort of see by the map, so the two largest countries in the world are number one, Russia, number two, Canada. And these are both countries in which the fur trade played a central role. So Russia expands eastward during the course of the 16th and 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, uh, in part because of the importance of the fur trade. So people are traveling into these forested areas and they're trying to acquire furs. And the same logic applies to the second biggest country in the world, which is Canada, which also has originally an economy that's based on the fur trade. This was not, though, their original intention. Okay, So the way in which Europeans become aware of these animals in Canada was that they're arriving in Newfoundland, and they're setting up these stages and flakes, and maybe they're gathering some firewood, or maybe they're outfitting their ships. While they're there, they encounter the indigenous population. And the indigenous population are kind of curious by the Europeans, because the Europeans have objects that, that, that might be useful. They have a lot of metal objects, for example. And most indigenous people in North America don't have much metal other than copper. So here's an iron knife, or here's an iron ax. They're kind of interested in acquiring that. They're also very interested in European textiles. They have clothing, it's woven. Again, it's something that doesn't exist in North America. And so they start to trade, but what do the indigenous people have to trade? Well, they have clothing off their back. They have uh, the hides of animals they've trapped and hunted, which they wear as clothing, and the Europeans realize over the course of time that, oh, wait, there's a market for these furs in Europe. People are paying a lot of money for them. And so while the fishermen go on shore, they bring with them metal items, they bring with them beads, they bring with them uh, textiles, and they trade it to native groups for furs. And, and originally it's not very important. It's maybe some of these add to cargoes of fish. Okay, so you're a fisherman, you, most of what you're gonna, money you're going to make is going to come from your codfish. But you might also bring some beads and some metal axes and some scissors and trade those and then come back and supplement that with some furs uh, that you bring home as a result of this trade. Uh, and so by the 1500s, this is sort of becoming something that both sides expect. So this is Jacques Cartier, so this Breton, this French explorer who goes up the St. Lawrence River in the 1530s, when he arrives there, He's very, he's greeted in a very friendly way. Okay, so here's a quotation. We came across on the way many of the people of the country who brought us fish and other provisions, at the same time dancing and showing great joy at our coming. And in order to win and keep their friendship, the captain, I mean Jacques Cartier, made them a present of some knives, beads, and other trifles, whereat they were greatly pleased. After this, they brought us quantities of fish and of their bread, which is made of corn, throwing so much of it onto our longboats that it seemed to rain bread. Okay, so already there's a trade established, so they're trading various goods, fish, food, this would be corn or maize, but also one of the items of trade, as you can see from this image, is furs. Now, the market for furs increases at the end of the 1500s, uh, partly because there's warfare in the Baltic, which would, which would have given people access to Moscow. There's also warfare in the Netherlands, which is one of the main hubs, main hubs of trade. So all of a sudden, French uh, hat makers, French haberdashers who make clothing are cut off from their supplies of fur. They know that there are furs that are possible to obtain from fishermen who are traveling to Newfoundland, and they put two and two together, and they realize, oh, wait a minute, why don't we start acquiring furs from Canada? And it's precisely at this time, there's sort of a new trend in fashion, which hatters in Paris decide they're going to sell beaver hats. And so now the prices for beaver furs start to shoot up. People know that 
beavers are virtually extinct in Europe, but there are lots of them in Canada. So they start to uh, ask for traders to, to travel to Canada in order to obtain more furs. And so here's a, a diagram showing half prices in Paris. And you'll notice in 1580, 1580 it's 100 so for beaver, 300 by 1650. 320s at the dark rate, 800 so. Okay, so a beaver hat all of a sudden becomes much more expensive, much more valuable uh, than a felt hat. It's made out of fabric, made out of um, woven, woven, woven wool. Um, and so, as a consequence, the beaver themselves become fabulously desired. Uh, and so, one of the to, to come back to the question of geography. One of the things, if you want to get furs, you have to get them at the source, okay? So the places where you're going to find the most, the best, and the most uh, abundant furs are going to be in northern forest, okay? So it's going to be hunters and trappers living in the interior, especially in the north, who are going to provide you with the most abundant quantities of furs. Uh, and so what this requires is for you to find methods of transportation, that are going to lead to the interior. Okay, so up to this time, the French weren't terribly interested in Canada itself. They were mostly interested in the waters off Canada. Now, because they're looking for furs, the interior becomes much more interesting. So you can see from this map, the map of the fur trade, these they're all those rivers that feed into the interior, especially this Great Lakes St. Lawrence system, the River of Canada, the River St. Lawrence leads all the way to the center of the economy. So now, Canada becomes much more interesting to the French. Initially, it's mostly as a trade monopoly. So in the early 1600s, there are a series of trade monopolies that are granted to various companies. And it's quite likely, it's quite possible, you could have just had Canada as a trading monopoly rather than actual colony. Uh, and it's actually quite valuable. You can see that for much of this period, the value of the monopoly, the value of the furs is going up consistently. So people who can trade can get a lot of return on their money. But I should point out that this doesn't require permanent settlement. All the work of the fur trade is being done by indigenous people. It's indigenous people who hunt and trap these animals. It's indigenous people who process those animals. So for the French, it's just a trade, something that they obtain through trading a variety of articles of, 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 of goods they bring over from, from Europe. Tremendously profitable. You can see that beaver, beaver pelts sold at a 2,000% markup from prices of the original purpose. So you could actually buy a beaver pelt uh, for uh, two axes, two iron axes, which don't cost you very much, bring it back to Paris and sell it at 20 times the 20 times the price. And in fact, European manufacturers make the point of designing certain elements, certain items, whether they're beads or kettles or axes, according to the tastes of native consumers. Okay, so as I said, settlement, like permanently bringing over French people, was not a priority. There usually was some provision in charters that required that a company would bring over certain settlers. They largely ignored them. So by 1663, we had a total population of Canada of 3,000 people. Okay, so it's not a huge population for this entire area, only 3,000 people. Uh, what's more, most of this continent, you can see from this image, so this image is uh, depicting, this is from 1795. Okay, so the white area is the area that's known by non-native Canadians, known by white people. So the black area is territory that's unknown to Euro Canadians. So most of Canada as we know it now is basically indigenous territory well into the end of the 18th century. So it's only these arteries of transportation, these river systems that lead into the interior that are known by Europeans because most of the work of the fur trade is being done by indigenous people. Okay, and so part of the problem here was that having a permanent settlement, the 
have to maintain courts of law, you have to have a hospital, you have to maintain churches, you have to build roads. And this would have cut into the profits of companies. They had no incentive to encourage migration. So if you're going to have migration, it's going to mostly come from the top down. It's going to come from the king. And so sure enough, it's this king, Louis XIV, in 1663, who decides to place greater emphasis into the development of Canada. So he's often known as the Sun King. He sort of has this expansive idea of power of the monarchy. And one attribute of this is that he wants to build up his dominions in Canada. He sort of views it as part of the, the, the glory of his royal family. So he's a young man. He's actually just a boy at this time. Comes of age in 1651. And in 1663, he assumes direct control of Canada, of New France. Uh, and so now it's not owned by a monopoly. It's not owned by a private company. It's directly controlled by the king. And so he's going to do whatever he can to turn New France into a mirror image of old France. So he chooses the name New France because he wants this country to be an expression of the glory of his country. And so he's going to invest into bringing over immigrants from France and turning the area around the St. Lawrence River, as I said, into a kind of echo of the old country. And so what happens in the ensuing years is you sort of have um, three different kinds of New France, okay? So you have a wider New France. The wider New France is a vast territory in North America. It's mostly populated by indigenous people, by First Nations. And it's, well, it's woven together through the fur trade and by diplomacy. And you have a much narrower New France around the St. Lawrence River Valley. It's often also referred to as Canada. And then you have other societies, whether it's Acadia to the east, Illinois to the south, Louisiana even more to the south, that are under French control, but largely how we have very tiny French populations and are mostly indigenous. So just to give you an idea here, here's a map of North America in 1700. Uh, and you notice by far and away, it's New Spain that's the most populous area. So you've got five to seven million people in New Spain. The English colonies are smaller geographically, smaller in terms of population. They've got two, about 250,000. And then to the north in the green is New France. So all of New France has a white French population of 15,000 people. That's all that area to the west, to the west of the Mississippi, to the north, all the way to the Arctic, 15,000 people. It's kind of a fraction of the population of what you have in New Spain. I mean, I think Mexico City this time has about 100,000 people. So not only is New France not even as big as Mexico City at this time, it's probably smaller than certain neighborhoods in Mexico City. It's a tiny population, uh, partly because there's no reason to have larger populations. Okay? So the indigenous population is al already small. It's being decimated by disease. And the French, because they rely particularly on the fur trade, don't have any rationale, as the English do, for bringing over people in order to maintain uh, farms that are going to produce commodities. So um, along the St. Lawrence River Valley, as I said, Louis XIV wants to recreate France in Canada. And so one of the ways he does this is he gives land to lords, to what are people are known as seigneurs. So the seigneurs are these lords who control the land, and then in turn, underneath them, they lease out the land to censitaires, the people who pay a, a rent, or commonly known as habitants. Uh, and so it's still kind of a feudal manorial system in which the lord would owe fealty or foyer homage to the crown, and the habitant would owe rents and dues to the lord. But in practice, it actually turns out to something quite different. Okay, so people come to the river, and because of the importance of the river as an artery of transportation, everyone wants to have their land. Everyone wants to have their lot on the river. So you see this to this very day, in Quebec, in, in Canada, along the St. Lawrence River, all the land is in these narrow strips. They're known as rangs. 
Okay, so these kind of uh, strips that adjoin the river. And so all this agricultural land, you can see this is this kind of an aerial photo from today. All this agricultural land is divided up into strips, uh, which adjoin the river, which show the importance of the river. So this is another map illustrating the road between Quebec City and Montreal. And so this is actually a visitor from, from Sweden in 1749. He said, the countryside, so he's describing Canada, the countryside is quite beautiful everywhere, and it's a pleasure to see how prettily is inhabited so densely on both sides of the river. One could almost say that it forms a continuous village which begins in Montreal and extends as far as Quebec. And here's another observer from 1821, a British observer. From Quebec to Montreal, the country may be considered as one long village, the same phrase, one long village between those two cities. On one shore, there's a stripe of land, seldom exceeding a mile in breadth, which is bounded by forest and thickly studded with farmhouses, whitewashed from top to bottom. To these, log barns and stables are attached to commonly a neat plot of garden ground. Um, so uh, one, I, I mentioned you know, that the French sort of had this intention of reestablishing a kind of feudal relationship, feudal system in Canada. And so in France itself, this can be actually quite oppressive. So this is an image of a peasant in France saying, ne pour la peine, okay, born to suffer. And it shows a peasant who's ground down by taxes, by seigneurial duties, uh, by rents, who's kind of suffering as a result of all these impositions. Uh, and here's another image of France sort of showing peasants as sort of the epitome of poverty. Wasn't the case in New France, okay? So because seigneurial duties were quite light, taxes were quite low, uh, most habitants more or less had the farms as their own particular own personal estate. Uh, and so this is an image of an habitant who would be working for his own. Often, you know, they would also have access to the forest. They'd be able to go hunt and fish and trap in those areas. And often they would look, they kind of, some of them would go out into the fur trade. They would trade with indigenous people. Sometimes they would take on an indigenous wife. And so in terms of the clothing they wear, it's kind of a métissage. It's kind of a, a mixture of the indigenous and the French. So here they're wearing a belt. It's called a ceinture fléchée. It's kind of a it's a belt that actually comes from indigenous people with whom they trade. So it's kind of this mixed culture. Uh, so here you can see in 1787, very similar to what you see today, these strips of land adjoining the river. And the people who live on these farms are, when, when the French people travel to Canada, one of the things they remark on is how independent they are, how, how willful they are. So this is Louis Franquet, who's a French official, arrives in 1715, 1750. He says, the average Canadian is unruly, obstinate, and will do nothing but what he wants or fancies. Those who make their living driving carriages create a scandal and make it a point of honor to flaunt their expertise and their forces strength by passing the carriages ahead of them without considering the risks and the dangers involved, which if you've driven in Montreal, persists to this very day. Here's another French official, Gilles Ocar from 1739, Canadians are by nature tall, well-built, and of strong character. Since the trades are not encumbered by guilds, and since workers were scarce at the beginning of the, col the, beginning of the colony, Canadians by necessity have become industrious over the generations. The habitants in the country are handy with an axe and make most of their implements and agricultural tools themselves. They like honors, endearments, and pride themselves on being brave. They are extremely sensitive to scorn, to the slightest punishment, they are selfish, revengeful, and subject to drunkenness. They drink large amounts of brandy and do not have the reputation of being trustworthy. Okay, so here he's reflecting the attitude of a French official who is used to having people underneath him who are obedient, who are polite, and here are a group of people who have a mind of their own. All right, so I'm, I'm actually I'm running out of time, so I'll just quickly wrap it up here. There's a lot more I could say, but I'll, I think I'll just open up for questions soon. As I said, you know, the population of New France is quite small compared to the English colonies that live to the south. Uh, so you can see by 1760, New France has 64,000 people. By contrast, the English colonies have 1.6 million. So there's a real um, lopsided comparison between the population of New France, which has this vast territorial area, and then the English colonies, which are much more uh, tightly packed. And so I won't go into details, but in 1759, 
or the 1750s, there's a war that takes place between France and England. And the British, the English win the war. Okay? In 1759, the British conquered Quebec City. In 1760, they conquered Montreal. And then at the end of the war in 1763, you have the Treaty of Paris. And under the Treaty of Paris, Canada is ceded by the French to the British. Okay? So the society that's supposed to be a recreation of France in the Americas has now been abandoned by the French and it's placed under British rule. Okay, so this is why in Canada we have French and English. Okay, so originally this was a French, French territory uh, and then it's conquered by the British. And originally the hope of the British is to simply integrate the Canadians into the British Empire. So they make all kinds of concessions to them. They, they grant them, they recognize the right to practice Catholicism. They recognize the system of land they have. They expand their territory so it includes all of the Great Lakes. Part of the reason why the British are making these concessions to the French population of Canada is because their English-speaking colonists to the south are about to engage in the American Revolution. They're about to engage in a war of independence against Great Britain. And so during the course of that war, there are a number of Americans who are opposed to the American cause of independence. We often refer to them as loyalists. And when the war ended, okay, so these are people who had been involved in a kind of civil war in the colonies. The, the, the cause of independence had won. The United States emerged as an independent country. And so the loyalists were living among the people who whom they'd fought a war, they, they couldn't get along. And so the loyalists, after the war, many of them, including my own family, uh, move northward from the colonies to Canada. Okay? And so now Canada, which had previously been entirely French, has an injection of English-speaking people. And by the 1790s, more and more English people arrive. And so you break up the country, you break up the colony into two parts. So you have Upper Canada, which is present-day Ontario around Toronto, which is Anglophone or English-speaking. And then you have Lower Canada, which is around Montreal, uh, which is francophone, becomes the other colony. I, I have a lot more to say, but I think I will I will uh, stop right here and I will open myself up to any questions you might have. Thanks, Professor. Yeah, uh, we remind everybody that you can please uh, uh, just open your mic and uh, ask questions directly, or if you prefer to also, you can raise your hand. Now, uh, if you want, you can post uh, your questions in the on the chat. And if anybody wants to ask a questions in Spanish, just uh, put it, uh, post it in the chat, and I will be uh, glad to translate for the professor. Thank you. Okay, uh, I believe we already have some questions from uh, uh, from the team and uh, our team, and especially the team in, in Canada. Uh, Molik, I believe you have one question that. Uh, you were, you were going to ask the, the professor. Yeah, I have one question here from Molik and uh, I'll, I'll do, uh, so professor, uh, we were, uh, Molik was, we were discussing this in the, on the chat. So who was the first explorer that actually ventured west? Uh, as I understood, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I believe that uh, the fur, the, the look for the for the beavers, is what actually make uh, uh, the French, especially, go west. Until until then, it was not uh, there was not much interest. But there was any person, any particular person that actually like an explorer that say, okay, let's let's do this and uh, let's let's go explore that part of the the Canadian and now Canadian country that uh, was previously that uh, basically untouched. Yeah, I mean, there, there are several, I mean, there are multiple explorers. Uh, so one is La Vérandrie, who's someone who travels into the West. And so he has a lot of places that are named after him. There's also the Sieur de la Salle, who, uh, who travels down the Mississippi River. Okay, so the, again, this is not in present day Canada, but he travels all the way south. And so he claims Louisiana on behalf of the French. Uh, but there are many others. Okay, so there are a variety of, of French who ex explorers who travel into the West. And they're also English, okay? So the English, which I didn't talk about, at the same time, the French are going through the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes. You also have the British who are coming from the North, 
in what's it, Hudson's Bay, and they formed the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, and they're also sending out explorers to various places. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, off the top of my head, I can think of La Vérendry and I can think of La Salle, but uh, there are many other explorers uh, who go westward. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Professor. So, uh, we have one. We have a few questions on the uh, on the chat. I don't know if you can see it, but I can read it for you if you like. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, how was the relationship between uh, English and French with locals, such as uh, the Algonquins? Uh, Ask Eduardo Zamora. Uh, in generally, much more positive with the French than with the English. Uh, the French depended on the Algonquins uh, for trade goods. And they were also military allies. And there's also another aspect, which I didn't talk about, was that the French were also sending out missionaries. And uh, a number of the Algonquins and other indigenous groups were faithful Catholics. Uh, and so they had a kind of an emotional connection to the French. Uh, and so in I don't want to sugarcoat the French. You know, there's all yeah. Cases with the French were also quite brutal in the way in which they dealt with indigenous goods, but in general, uh, much more positive with the French because the French, you know, for a variety of interests, for a variety of reasons, had self-interest in maintaining good relations with the indigenous people. Um, so, yeah, we have another question. So, that we're more questions coming on the chat. So, uh, I don't know if you can read them. Uh, uh, at the time, yeah. the French traveled to the east, to the west, through the land, or by the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, it was by canoe. So if you wanted to get to the east or the west, uh, you would you would uh, load yourself into a canoe. Often these would be huge canoes, uh, but they would have voyageurs. So these would be French uh, habitants who would have lots of experience in, in handling canoes. Uh, they would be able to go down rivers, very fast rivers, uh, without tipping over. Uh, they would go through lakes, they would portage, so they would carry up the canoe and they walk over certain areas of land. But you know, typically it was the canoe that people used well, and basically until the middle of the 1800s, when you have the evolution of railroads, it really was the canoe that, that was the main main item of transportation, main means of transportation. Right. What's the truth about Alaska? Was it sold by the Russians? That, that sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it sounds it interesting. It's, it's sold by the Russians the same year that Canada is formed as a country. So Canada is made up of all these, I didn't get to this, but it's made up of this different colonies that are united in 1867, the exact same year that Russia was sold uh, by the Russians to the Americans. Um, so Alaska has an interesting story because, you know, initially the European power that was most interested in Alaska was the Russians and they'd come over. And then the Spanish actually started sailing up to California because they knew that, they, you know, as far as the Spanish were concerned, this is Russia, this is Spanish territory. Like all, all of the Western part of the continent belonged to the Spanish. And so part of the reason why the Spanish made developed more of a presence in California was because they were nervous about the Russians. But the people they should have been most nervous about were, were the United States. Um, okay. Um, how is the relationship between Canada and Queen Elizabeth from England? Uh, it seems there's some, some love. And it, uh, what happened? Ah, okay. Good question. Uh, I think I, before, I, before I finished off, I, I mentioned that the English-speaking population of Canada originally came from loyalists. So after the American Revolution, it was people who were loyal, loyal to the British king who came to Canada. So there's this really strong sentimental attachment that English-speaking Canadians for a long time had towards Great Britain and the king. I can see that you know, my, my own grandfather had a picture of the king, a picture of the queen, queen in, in, our di in his dining room. Um, and so there's a, there's a, a lot, I mean, but that's, that's an older generation of Canadians. So what's happened since the 1960s and 1970s is there's been more of a push to develop a distinctively Canadian identity that's not French, that's not British. And so that's why we developed a new flag. The Canada adopted this new flag. I think um, Moudlac had one in his background. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a, supposed to be not French, not English. Uh, so... I think for the younger generation, there isn't much sentimental attachment to Queen Elizabeth. We still have her on our money, but I think most Canadians wouldn't, be, wouldn't shed many tears if, if, if she disappeared. Um, okay. okay. Uh, where those original French live today? Still in Quebec? Yes. Okay. Another good question. Um, mostly in Quebec. Okay. So most of the, the, the densest population of, 
of, of, of French speakers in Canada is in Quebec, and it's really a distinct, it's the one province that is, it has French as an official language. But that was no, by no means uh, a, a foregone conclusion. Initially, most French people thought that they would move westward, and there were a lot of French migrants uh, who went west. Uh, there's a Métis population, so Métis is like similar to Mestizo in, in, in Spanish, so it's a mixed population that developed around Winnipeg in the center of the country. Uh, so today, yes, it's overwhelmingly in Quebec, uh, but there's still about a million French-speaking people in the rest of the, can the country. There's a, a French-speaking population in Saskatchewan, there's a French-speaking po population uh, in Ontario, there's a French-speaking population of Acadians uh, in the east. So mostly in Quebec, but also all over the country. Uh, okay, Fernando, um, from a sociological point of view, how do you think having two somewhat strong opposite cultures, English versus French, has shaped today's Canadian culture? Again, wow, you're asking a lot of good questions. Um, well, there's a lot of tension, okay, especially since, you know, that it's, it's, a, it's a country that's founded from conquest, okay, so it's not like two groups of people came over and jointly held hands and decided, let's be friends. No, it, 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 there's a way in which uh, the incorporation of Canada into the British Empire was came from warfare. And after the war, it tended to be the English who dominated in business. Okay, so the, the English, a lot of them came up in the United States. They had this kind of business mindset. And so the business sector tended to be dominated by the English. Most of the French were, were tended to be working class. And so there was this kind of real class tension. Like with, it still exists to this very day. I mean, now you have a lot of francophones who are in the business sector, and there's there's less of a difference there. Uh, but there's also a lot of tension between French and English. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Quebecois French is different with international French. Uh, uh, where does where's the difference come from? Uh, great question. Okay. So yes, it absolutely is uh, different. There are some ways in which uh, French uh, is spoken in Quebecois has certain words, certain vocabulary items, and certain rules of grammar that are quite, uh, it, to French ears, to people from France, it sounds like someone just frozen in the 17th century. Uh, so for example, um, uh, it's, so there's it's often referred to as the interrogative tu. Uh, so when you ask a question in Quebecois French, one of the ways you can do so is by adding the word tu to a sentence. Uh, so um, I won't give it an example, but it's, it's something that people would have done in France 300 years ago, but they don't do anymore. Uh, so often there's this kind of a snobbish view that Quebecois French is somehow more backward, but I don't think that's, it just evolved in a different direction. I'm guessing, you know, I'm in, in, in Latin America, the Spanish people speak in Chile is very different from the Spanish people speak in Spain, right? Yeah, it's quite, yeah. There's a lot of difference uh, from country to country. It's very, yeah. 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 And so it's just a product of a different evolution. Um, but the difference really comes from kind of, you know, being separated from another country for a period of time. You start to develop different accent, different vocabulary items. And so every country has its own version of French or its own version of Spanish or its own version of English. Perfectly. We have a few more questions. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You should, you should start selling. Uh, yeah, the, just uh, for the record, uh, I believe you are aware of Sean uh, Sang is our CFO, so you will see <laughs> the, the question is directly at the profit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can set you up with some some uh, French uh, fur traders, and I'm sure they can use some big, tidy profits. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you uh, explain more on why the French have disliking for their French Canadian seeing that? Um, what? that Could you explain, expand on that? Yeah, Miriam uh, is asking, Quebecois uh, French is different now uh, with international French. Uh, which which one? Uh, the, the latest one. Yeah, Can you expand more on the, the French hat that is lacking for French Canadians, uh, seeing that that particular narrative is still seen today? So uh, I believe that you, you already covered that one in the, in the previous list. Uh, so, but basically, the Yanisha is asking if. Uh, there's any, hey, well, the, the way I interpret hey, her question is that, do you, in your opinion, is there any historical reason to, from, you know, uh, Quebecois or a French Canadian to dislike the, the French? Yeah, um, I mean, 
it's that's um, I'm not getting into political issues just from the historical that, perspective. So often I could I just know like speaking like I, I even though I'm English Canadian I, I you know I speak I speak Quebecois French and I when I visited France they would they, they would make fun of my accent they would make fun of me they they kind of look down on me like they say it sounded like someone from the country or they pretend like I didn't know what I was saying and so okay. I think there's um, for the French, there's often French. France sometimes expresses a kind of certain snobbery that, that rubs people the wrong way. On the other hand, I would say, you know, in the past, especially in the past 20 or 30 years, we have more and more people from France, especially young people, who are coming to Quebec, who are living here or often staying here. Uh, so I'd say that the, the French now they have a better understanding of, of Quebec and the Quebecois culture, and then more of an appreciation of our culture. And so I'd say it's, uh, I don't want to disparage the French for, 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 for being too snobbish. Uh, I'd say things are better than they once were. Uh, but why the, I don't think the French, the French didn't so much dislike French Canadians. They sort of viewed them with pity or viewed them as, you know, oh, our, our, our old cousins who got lost and are, you know, they, they're not significant anymore. But that's, le that's less, less prevalent today than it once was. So uh, you mentioned that uh, the loyals uh, were a big part of the... I didn't get involved. Sorry. I wasn't involved. Minimally involved. It wasn't even minimally. It wasn't even concerning her. I know. But so uh, anybody who wants to ask a question, please. Uh, yes. Uh, otherwise, please move, uh, mute your mic. So, uh, Professor, you mentioned the, the, the loyals. Uh, basically, they, they migrate or when uh, the U.S. independence happened, you know, that's... Uh, yeah, uh, strictly speaking, July the 4th, uh, 1776, yeah. and the Declaration of Independence. So, so they feel that uh, they need to support uh, Britain. So when they migrate outside the colony, saying that, okay, uh, I still want to be a part of the British Empire, correct? correct. Or Britannia, Britannia called at the time, because the, the correct time was Britannia, correct? Yeah. So, uh, they are, and uh, they, they, you mentioned that this they made a big part of the population at the time. Uh, do you have any, any, any idea of, in terms of numbers? So they kind of uh, overwhelmed the existing population at the time. It was kind of up to par. I, I was wondering how much of an, you mentioned that it had an impact, but I was wondering if it's like, well, like okay, like uh, like nowadays, for example, we see migration or we receive, uh, you know, uh, people that in need from other countries or they actually took control because of the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. So Initially, the numbers are, are quite small, and they're mostly so. Initially, they're able to handle them because, in part, because the migrants are going to different places. They're not. They're not going to Quebec. They're not going to Montreal or, or the area on uh, um, uh, Quebec City. Um, but they're still. Oh, they're maybe oh, I'm trying to think. Basically, by they're, I'm trying to trying to express something complex here. Okay, so initially, it's quite a small. Like say, ninety percent of the population is still going to be French speaking. Uh, and the English speakers are going to be mostly moving to the area around what's now Toronto and then some others to the further to the east. So they're in geographically different areas. So ultimately what happens is uh, that, so first of all, you have this initial wave of, of loyalists, but you also have some Americans who come over. So after the war, the British promised promise cheap land to anyone who declares himself as a loyalist. So some Americans who don't care about the British crown or don't care about the war, they just want cheap land. They also come over and they, they came, so often refer to them as late loyalists uh, because they're not really ideologically motivated. They just want cheap land. By about 1815, I'd say the, the difference, if you look at Canada, both, so they, what happens is they break away those jurisdictions. So upper Canada becomes the English speaking area, lower Canada becomes the French speaking area. I'd say in 1815, I'd say the population uh, is about 70% French. So I'd say Lower Canada is has a larger population than, than Upper Canada. But what happens in the ensuing years is that more and more immigrants come to Canada, especially from Ireland and from Scotland, and they all join the English-speaking side. Uh, and so by the middle of the 1800s, now it's an English-speaking majority. So there's kind of this balance, this step. So initially, it's a small population of Anglophones. And it's still a dominantly Francophone population. Uh, but because they're moving to different areas, they don't run up and wind up speaking French. They keep on speaking English. And because it's the British Empire, it's acceptable to keep on speaking English. 
Okay. So what happens over the course of time is that the Anglophone population becomes much larger. So by, by now, by today, we've got 8 million Francophones, but 32 million Anglophones. So the entire country now is tipped more in the English direction. I see. I and I, yeah, nice. Thank you for that. And I, if I may expand a little bit on that one, uh, if we compare the migration, uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the, the increase in uh, English uh, speakers was were because Ireland, from Ireland and many other parts of uh, uh, Britain, they were traveling, they were migrating to, to Canada. In the, in the U.S., mostly the, uh, the migration happened, uh, or not, not the only reason, but one of the biggest reasons was uh, to escape from uh, religious uh, persecution. You know, mostly of the United States is, uh, is not Catholic. So uh, I wa was wondering if in the case of those migrants, it was the same. Like uh, they were moving to Canada for the same reason, or it was more, more li mostly for economic reasons, the free land that you mentioned? I'd say mostly economic reasons. So, so New France was was officially Catholic. You could not could not live in New France if you were a Protestant. Uh, so this is one of the problems the British have when they when they conquer uh, New France is the British are are Protestant and they're bigoted towards Catholics, but they have this population of seventy thousand people who are devout Catholics. Um, and so the subsequent waves of immigrants they're mostly coming over for economic opportunity there's actually a lot of tension between catholics and protestants so even in when i was a child uh the school boards you had to choose to go for a catholic catholic school board or a protestant school yeah it wasn't defined by french and english it was defined by if you were a catholic or if you were a protestant uh, so, but I'd say most of them, yeah, most immigrants are coming over for essentially economic reasons, not so much, not so much religion. Yeah. Okay, we have a few more questions on the chat. Oh. Okay, je me souviens, showing on the car plate of Quebec, what French, what it means. Okay, so actually the full phrase originally, and you can still see there's a statue that has that, je me souviens que né sous le lys, je grandis sous la rose, which means I remember that born under the French fleur de lys, born the lily, the, the symbol of, of France, I grow up under the rose, the symbol of England. So initially it was sort of this reminder that, okay, I come from French origins, but I'm going to flourish in an English essay, in an English context. A lot of people ignore that last bit and they just say, je me souviens, so it more means, um, I'll remember the conquest, or I'll remember what the English did to us. <laughs> so, it's, so basically, it's, I will never forget. <laughs> never forget. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to, to set up my PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, I'd be happy. To, I, I can set that up with you, Nisha, if you like. Yes, well, take care of that, and we'll share the link with all the participants. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Yeah. We have a, a, a few more. Uh, uh, this is kind of a <laughs> loaded question, and uh, that, uh, Numan Drisi is asking, uh, what is Canada place in today's world, and uh, how will it evolve in the coming future? So that's kind of a whole dissertation, probably, in itself. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah, I mean... But no, it will be interesting to, yeah, to hear your opinion, Professor. Yeah. We're a relatively small country, so uh, and, and we're overwhelmed by the United States. You know, it's it's a, uh, like a lot of countries in the Americas. It's sort of the United States casts a very long shadow. So I think uh, Canada perhaps ha has a role to play in terms of. Sorry, Camila, please move your mic. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, Canada's role to play to perhaps be, you know, developing a, a, an international profile that stands for something other than what the United States stands for. I, I don't want to get too much into politics. That is for sure. That is for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, it, um, okay. Uh, okay. Muchas gracias to all the people. Um, okay. Um, So there's uh, one question from Fernando Galvez, and interesting, and uh, this is uh, like you mentioned, uh, Canada is very different from the United States, and uh, uh, this is uh, Canada might be one of the countries that received the most immigrants in relation to its total population and recent years. How uh, there ever been serious racial tensions in Canada soil, Canadian soil? Uh, yes. So I mean, that should uh, well, two two different questions. So so first, it is kind of an. Uh, a remarkable thing that Canada, I think, has had one of the highest rates of migration in the world for the past 40 years or so. 
And there's relatively little tent. I mean, most if you uh, more than most countries, if you ask Canadians if they're in favor of immigrants, the favor of immigration, overwhelmingly Canadians would say yes. Uh, if you ask the immigrants themselves, they have a stronger attachment to Canada than virtually any other country that receives large numbers of migrants. Uh, so Canada, I guess, in some ways, has been a success in that respect. Have there ever been serious racial tensions in Canada? Yes, yes. Uh, Canada has a very ugly racial past, um, not only in terms of the treatment of Indigenous people, so I didn't get to the way in which Indigenous people were treated, uh, especially after, once you, know, once you have the building of railroads, once agricultural land is given to white people, uh, it, this, Canada has a shameful record on that regard, shameful record towards treating towards uh, African Canadians, Canadians, uh, so for a long time, uh, you couldn't, if you're a black person in Nova Scotia, you could not enter into a movie theater and sit in the same seats as a white person. Uh, so lots of racial tension, lots of tension between French and English. So I don't want, I don't want to paint a, to a rosy picture of Canada, but I would say on the question of immigration, I think Canada, it, we're relatively harmonious. Like most Canadians I know, I, mean, well, I grew up going to school with immigrants and uh, all my, lots of friends who are immigrants and I, most Canadians are very in favor of immigration. Thank you for that, Professor, and thanks for all the whole presentation, and thanks for uh, you know uh, answering all those questions. And uh, on that diversity note, that I think that we can uh, wrap the band. And uh, uh, I believe, my personal opinion, if I'm allowed to say, yeah, that Canada is one of the most diverse country, and uh, not only the best because because many countries call themselves diverse, and I will not speak ill of the the u.s but obviously the attitude towards that is different yeah. now people feel different and now uh, uh, conversion we as a pan american company we we care a lot about diversity uh, you have people from many places here just in our headquarters in canada i believe that we have more than uh, 26 uh, different idioms that speak uh, are speaking our headquarters so we have people from all over the world we're a pan american company and uh we started this series to uh, talk about the cult, different cultures, but not uh, in the sense that how we, the, those uh, difference set us apart, but quite the opposite, how we come together with the, that kind of diversity. So thanks a lot, Professor, for your for all the knowledge that you gave us today. Yeah. Thank you very thanks much. everybody for attending. Uh, we are going to be uh, sending a, uh, a survey. Uh, please, Janice, uh, uh, if you can post it in the, in the chat. We will appreciate if you guys uh, uh, share your thoughts about uh, today's presentation. We will uh, we'll love that. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.